the people in Silicon Valley are assuming there's one version of the world. They're assuming Western liberal values. There's something called a integrated joint operations platform that the Chinese government run. Now, have we arrived at that dystopian world? The technology has been developed to literally track your eyeballs. But I would love to be someone who's sitting on the beach and, you know, get an AI machine to do my podcast. Will AI solve the perennial moon sighting problem we face? <laughs> Can you imagine AGI, artificial general intelligence, acquiring a level of consciousness that human beings have? Can a supercomputer become a Khalifa? The 80s movie Terminator depicts a bleak world where a cyborg assassin is sent to the past to eliminate the mother of an unborn child who holds the key to humanity's salvation. The frightening prospect of machines that can teach themselves and in the worst case scenario, machines that are more intelligent than human beings, has led senior scientists to raise the alarm about the ethics of artificial intelligence AI and its potential destructive force. For Muslims, AI raises many ethical questions about human society, the economy, and indeed, the potential for AI-inspired ishtihad, machines that tell us how to live our Islamic lives. Are scholars and orators about to go out of business as might be taxi drivers and couriers in the coming technological age? Now, to help us understand the world of AI, I have invited Riaz Hassan onto The Thinking Muslim. Riaz works in the field of innovation for many years and has had direct and extensive experience in the use of AI and the commercial use of ChatGPT. He has worked on using AI and robotics on one of the largest infrastructure projects in the country. He is responsible for looking at the wider dimensions of innovations with its associated impacts on our political economy. Riaz Hassan, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to The Thinking Muslim. Wa alaikum salam Jalal, good to be here. It's great to have you with us. Riaz, how do we know that I'm actually speaking to a human being in front of me or that you are not a, an, AI, uh, an AI drone or something? Well, I think for now, you'll just have to take my word for it that I'm not. Um, we can go into whether I'm conscious or not conscious and yeah. those kind of exploratory things we can cover off later. But you know what I mean, uh, Riaz? I mean, I think in the last year, we've seen so much out there about the mm. potential destructive effects of AI, the Terminator effect. I mean, should we be afraid of AI, Riaz? Well, I think it's a nuanced answer. I don't think um, a one word answer about saying whether we should or shouldn't justifies what's out there at the moment. Mm. Uh, I think we have to look at it in many lights, really. We have to look at it in terms of what AI is now, yeah. what it's capable of, or what some people say it should be capable of in, let's say, five to 10 to 20 years time. So we have to measure those kind of instances at different portions of their time. And some things we just don't know about. But I think it's right to have a air of caution about what we're doing or what mankind is doing with AI and the level of control that we have and the level of control that we may give over to machines like this. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, before we, we talk about the potential impacts of AI on Muslims and the Muslim mm -hmm. Ummah, I just want to understand what AI is in the first place. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I read a quick definition in the Oxford English Dictionary. It defines AI as the capacity of computers and other machines to exhibit and simulate intelligent behavior. I mean, can you explain what artificial intelligence is? Yeah, sure. So what I try and do is leave all the dictionary definitions or even the chat GPT definitions of AI mm -hmm. to the side, really. Yeah. Um, I think we have to look at AI in terms of its impact upon us as human beings and as a society. Right. Um, in, my co in my thinking, AI is an inconvenient truth that we have to deal with. Um, it can be a convenient truth in terms of the benefits that it can give us, but it's also a very inconvenient truth. Right. And it makes us uncomfortable because it takes us out of our comfort zone in many ways. Yeah. It makes us address questions that we've not really addressed or we've parked uh, in many ways as mankind. Um, I think the way to look at AI or the way people started looking at AI was as a tool initially. So people looked at it in terms of 
you know, is this a tool like a knife or a hammer? It has good uses, it has beneficial uses, and it has harmful uses. But I think that's a slightly misleading way to look at AI in general. I prefer to use the analogy of a fire, really, because a fire is something that can be of benefit to us, but it also can be of great harm to us. Right. But the additional thing with something like a fire is that it can lose control or we can lose control of a fire very, very quickly. It can become all encompassing. It can take over our lives, our villages, our towns, and we have no way of putting it out. We have no way of understanding how to remove the oxygen from the air that fuels the fire. Mm. So that's a more apt analogy of, of what AI has a potential to do or not to do. But I think it's also even, we, which we can explore later, it even goes beyond that analogy, which is some of the things that we can come on to. Sorry for the rather naive question here, but what's the difference between artificial intelligence and what we've become used to? Google searches, mm. computers, mm. the technology mm. around us. I mean, my phone is packed with amazing technology, which yeah. maybe 10, 15 years ago, I could only really achieve by, uh, by accessing a very big computer. Yeah. So I think what you've got to understand is that the technology is out there. AI is already in your phone. Oh. AI is already in your workspace, on your tablet, on your TVs and everywhere else. Right. So there's elements of AI, which we call narrow AI, which is already in place and which we take for granted already. Okay. So every time you pick up the phone to your bank and it says, you know, say my voice is my password, that is a form of AI, right? right? It's a form of AI when Netflix recommends your next viewing mm -hmm. categories. Right. So those are narrow forms of AI which are already in place, but they've become ubiquitous. So 10, 15 years ago, we thought that that was a, a major achievement in personalization or the way we do things. But nowadays we've taken that for granted and we've already become accustomed to that portion of AI that we think is something different. right? Um, and I think here we have to understand and appreciate what are the different dimensions of AI and its roadmap that it's progressing upon for the future. So you've said the narrow AI, mm -hmm. so give me the wider AI. What's yeah. like, give me the potential yeah. of wider AI, okay. if that's even a term. Well, it's not so much a wider AI. The narrow AI kind of conforms to what we mean by developing insights on data sets, right? So you watch a particular TV program, I know that down, I know that Jalal likes documentaries so that we recommend different documentaries for it. So it looks at different data sets mm. and tries to understand the correlation between the data sets and right. that's the way it works. Okay. Um, what we're moving into is a world of things like ChatGPT, which is generative AI. Mm. And then subsequent to that comes in something called uh, artificial general intelligence or general purpose intelligence, right. or some people call it super intelligence, right. which is the ability of the machine without human intervention to think for itself. Are we at that stage? Well, I don't think we're at that stage just yet. Yeah. We're at probably at the ChatGPT stage, right. which is about generative AI. Right, and generative AI is what? Generative AI generally means the ability for uh, the computer or the machine to look at the content that has been served up and then to combine different sources together and to publish or to generate text or images based upon the requirements that you've set. Mm. So if I can kind of explain that, because it's quite an important uh, distinction that we have to understand. Yeah. Um, what happens with generative AI is that for something like ChatGPT, for example, it's not so much its ability to understand language mm. and the words that you put in. What it does, it, am it amalgamates that language into statistical pockets, or mm. statistical tokens. Then it, kind of a pre then it kind of amalgamates them and it kind of develops associations between them. Yeah. So what it does, it, it looks at a thing called chunking. It chunks your data. It assigns different things called meaning spaces to it. Mm. And then it uses things called association or links between that data. Right. And then it assigns probabilities and works out on a probabilistic nature, mm. the kind of question that you've asked and the kind of response that you've got. Right. So in essence, some of the times when people say, well, chat GPT or generative AI has given me the wrong answer, it's not a wrong answer as such. It's that probability wise is developed the thing that you didn't want, mm -hmm. right? So those probabilities are increasing all the time and the accuracy is increasing all the time. Right. As more and more that we train these kind of modules to behave in the manner that we ask those questions. Mm -hmm. So that's the way 
generative AI has happened. So it's a bit of an illusion in the sense that people think it understands language, but it really doesn't. It right. just understands statistics. Mm. So that's the way it has developed. Right. And so AGI, mm -hmm. the next stage of AI, artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. what would be the market difference between AGI and generative <laughs> AGI, uh, artificial intelligence that we have now? So general purpose intelligence or super intelligence that Nick Bostrom likes to call it, yeah. um, I think is, is, a, is a name that we give to uh, machines that can recursively self-improve. Right. So that's without human intervention. Okay. So they can look at a goal that we've set it and they can recursively self-improve without our intervention. Yeah. And they have some level of autonomy in terms of doing that. Mm -hmm. So they can improve in iterations and those iterations can be significant in so, many ways. Yeah. They can sometimes even change the minuteness of their objectives yeah. and then behave almost as uh, entities in themselves in order to achieve what they were set out to achieve. Behave like human beings? Well, that's the key question, really. Do they behave like human beings? Now, yeah. currently, we're not at that stage at the moment. We are, by some estimations, we're five years off. By some estimations, we're 10 or 15 years off. Right. But it's getting closer all the time. Yeah. And I think we have to be prepared to understand how to deal with machines of that nature and in that being. Yeah. Um, it's the trajectory of the way AI has developed, especially in the last year since generative AI or things like ChatGPT have been on the market, yeah. has been almost exponential. Right. No one kind of foresaw the rapid development in these technologies yeah. uh, in this short period of time that we're in. So you're someone who works in AI, and I understand mm. from my discussion with you that you've worked with ChatGPT quite extensively yeah. in, your, in the corporate world. So ChatGPT came as a surprise to all of us, but mm. what do you expect we will see over the next 5, 10, 15 years if Allah subhanahu wa gives us life? Yeah. So I think you will see an improvement of the models that we have. Hmm. Definitely. I, I don't think there's any two ways about it. Right. You have um, the models have been enabled by the hardware technology, which has improved right. by X percent every year. Hmm. Um, so we are going to see improvement in the models, improvement in those probabilities that I was talking about yeah. in terms of the accuracy, in terms of the additional factors that are being built in into these mechanisms right. to go that extra step. And so already we're seeing things like generating images, generating videos, generating text content or speech content, mm. uh, you know, on a needs basis. And that will always improve. Mm. I think the key factor or the cliff edge is when we get to the general purpose AI and yeah. how that would evolve right. and wh what we would do in that respect. Right. So give me some idea of what would happen in that world when that breakthrough happens. What type of world should we expect? Well, I think that's a, that's a real unknown factor at the moment. Yeah. I don't think even the prophets in Silicon Valley quite understand what the implications of general purpose intelligence would be mm. and how we would get there. Right. Um, there are a number of issues there in terms of the self-recurring nature of the improvement in the machine. Yeah. Um, because a machine has different objectives already built into it. It has the objective of self-preservation. Yeah. It has the objective of trying to achieve what it's set out to do. Yeah. It has the objective of trying to uh, allocate as much resources or borrow resources or even steal resources mm. to achieve that objective. And it wants to self-learn at the same time. So once you open that Pandora's box, there is almost a, a unknowing ab ability from mankind itself or from even the senior engineers as to what may happen at that stage and mm -hmm. how and which way in or which direction that will go. That is why I think there's more than one attempt now to understand how to regulate the oncoming nature of AGI moving into the future. Riaz, I haven't seen, I mean, there were some predictions that mm. by now we would have driverless cars yeah. on our streets everywhere. Yeah. In fact, you know, we will be living in a new type of transport infrastructure with a new type of transport infrastructure. And we haven't seen that yet in any city in the world. Yes, we do see in some parts of the United States and I think Singapore where you've got um, driverless taxis, but they're very clumsy in a way and there's ways to to stop those taxis and to thwart them mm -hmm. and, and a lot of campaigners and protesters have done exactly that uh, why haven't we seen the proliferation of driverless cars on our streets okay so 
I think we need to take a step back and mm. understand the historical context of how AI has developed right. uh, over, let's say, the last few millennium. Mm. Um, I think AI people presume it to be some sort of fancy computer science. It seems like, you know, since the advent of computers, that's when we've had AI. But actually, that's not really true. AI in its essence is a mathematical notion. Uh, it's a mathematical notion in terms of probabilities. Mm. And that's how it works. So if we look at throughout history, right down from the time of, let's say, Aristotle, Aristotle was came up with the phrase of an instrument fulfilling its own work. Right. So that was the early notion of what AI was. Mm. And then it was developed by people like Imam Ghazali, for example. Imam in the Ghazali? Imam Ghazali in the 11th century yes. actually foretold some of the actual issues that we are facing with driverless cars, which, is the, yeah. which is the issue which is something called a trolley dilemma, <laughs> which is about in the AI world of self-driving cars, they have this concept of a trolley dilemma, which is that if a driverless car is going and it sees a particular object, it needs to swerve and the swerving may kill three or four people. Whereas if it continues on its path, it's going to kill its passenger. Mm -hmm. So which direction does it take? It's our appetite for risk really that they're trying to measure. Imam Ghazali in the 11th century had a version of this, which is about people on a boat, right? So there were a hundred people on a boat and he posed to his, his students a question which said that in, in his book, Mustasfa, mm. which suggested that, is it viable to throw 10 people off the boat when you know that the rest of the people are going to survive? Yes. So that was a, a, a hypothetical question that he posed his students. And the answer to that is quite revealing in how we as Muslims view this appetite for risk and this appetite for utilitarianism and how the rest of the world or maybe the West views that uh, same concept. Yeah. You what know? was the answer? Yeah. Well, I think Imam Ghazali's answer or the answer from the students who went into different dimensions, it wasn't just a yes, no answer. It was about, well, the sanctity of human life is precious in Islam, whether it's one life or many lives. Yes. But he also built into that this element of appreciation of uncertainty. So is it a certain is it certainty that those people will survive if you if you if you throw those people right. those 10 people off the boat. Okay. So he built this understanding of what uncertainty means right. and the classifications of uncertainty as well for his yeah. students, yeah. which was at that time something that was completely unheard of. Right. And then he built into this also the aspect of is it a different answer if the whole ummah is on the boat and you have to sacrifice 10 people, ah. right? Rather than just a few people. So there were many dimensions to that conundrum that he uh, kind of alluded to, which I think are still being used today in this very, very concept. So, so, so uh, I understand from what you've said there that, that underpinning AI is an ethics. It's a series of how do we define what is right and wrong? And of mm. course the Western world may, will certainly have a different ethical framework to that of the Islamic world. So are there Muslims in the, the field of AI that are trying to inject Islamic ethics as the, the basis for, for artificial intelligence? So at the moment, during my research, I haven't come across any Muslim ingestion of Islamic values into right. this space okay. at all, or, really? or on a very perfunctory level. I think there's two academics from Pakistan, one from Lahore, one from Karachi, who I think Meta have approached to inject some semblance of Islamic values into their conversations. Yeah. But at the moment, it's on a very peripheral level. It's nothing that is in any way relevant uh, right. at the moment. Yeah. And th this is my fear. My fear is that our values, our notion of the world as it should be, yeah. is being sidelined out of the equation. Really? The people in Silicon Valley are assuming there's one version of the world. They're assuming Western liberal values or mm -hmm. conservative values are the things that we should abide by when we're looking at these systems and when, when we're looking at the regulations for general purpose AI moving mm -hmm. into the future. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. And it's unfortunate that Muslim voices haven't been there. Muslim voices are involved in the industry in many levels, mm. but on a doctrinal level or on a level of understanding the ideas and the conundrums we may face, especially with 
artificial general intelligence, they are nowhere to be seen. Really? So we've got a scientist who may be embedded in mm -hmm. Meta or these exactly. various companies, but we don't have those who who develop the sort of the general frameworks. I mean, I, I, I noticed that if you type into chat GPT, I don't know, something about same-sex marriage or homosexuality, mm. yeah. you're going to get a fairly politically correct answer, yeah. uh, an answer which probably reflects a cosmopolitan, liberal-minded world. Is that what you're saying here? That exactly. the, the data sets, or at least the thinking that undergirds AI currently, is a very Western thinking. I exactly, that's right. So it's even noticeable in the generative AI that right. we have, right. but it's going to be even more noticeable when we move into the future with general purpose AI. So yeah. imagine if you like a, imagine if you like a French school in the future, ah. right? So you have the current situation in France with the muscular secularism or the radical secularism that's in play. Mm -hmm. So imagine a artificial general purpose intelligence system that's part of the French educational system. Right. right. What that does, it amplifies the values that it's been embedded with, right? So this radical kind of secularism is amplified on a much greater scale. Uh -huh. It's anonymized and it's automated in, in many respects. Yes. So you don't have the face-to-face, -face, say, for example, an argument with the teachers involved. You have a simply blank no from the computer, right? Yeah. So therefore, the, the actual actions that that will take or the values that are embedded in the system yeah. are not going to be values that are going to be pertaining to us. A another example of this is China. Yeah. So we see China has been first out of the blocks in terms of looking at regulations for AI. Mm. But one of their regulations I was reading recently was the fact that there was a statement in this that says AIs, AIs in the plural, should be regulated and should embody the concepts of socialism within their framework. Uh -huh. So whatever, I mean, we may argue about what the aspects of socialism means within China now or whether it's state capitalism. Yeah. But the fact is that people are already building these doctrinal ideals into the AI systems of the future. Right. And that's how they're being regulated. I want to come back to China, but the, the France example mm. is interesting. So you're saying that in the future, you could have a machine that sits uh, at the gates of a of school. And that machine would say, well, an African, a North African or an Asian looking mm -hmm. person wearing a long dress is not allowed in through the gates, whereas a, a white French person wearing a long dress, you know, is, is, it's perfectly fine. Exactly. Right. Exactly that scenario. Or somebody with some sort of, a, I don't know, a Palestinian headdress or something else like that or a yeah. sign or some symbol of religiosity yeah. is not allowed in. And then he can mix things with facial recognition ah. and uh, with you know, the emotions that you have in your face, you know, how you're feeling, to have this combined view about what you can and can't do. Now, have we arrived at that dystopian world? Because I, I read maybe a few years back, maybe two or three years back, in fact, in East Turkestan, Xinjiang, mm -hmm. where, of course, uh, the Muslims are being heavily persecuted yeah. in China um, uh, before the concentration camps were set up. There were cameras that could recognize the facial features of <clears throat> those Muslims uh, and, yeah. and, and then forbid them from, uh, from catching trains or even catching planes. Mm -hmm. So without even knowing their particular identity, they could see, well, this person is a Han Chinese and this person is, you know, has the features of a Uyghur. Of a Uyghur. Yeah. Um, you know, is that AI? So that's very definitely AI. Really? And in order to look at some dystopian future of AI, we don't have to go far. Yeah. We can just go to Xinjiang or East Turkmenistan, as it's called, right? Yeah. Where there are literally 13 million upwards of, you know, our Muslim brothers who are living under this dystopian future at the moment that we very speak, right? Yeah. So give me some examples. of. You know. So for example, the data points that are in that region to capture information about the person are just extensive. They are mind boggling. There's something called a integrated joint operations platform that the Chinese government run, which is the IJOP. Huh. Uh, that convolutes and that combines all these different data points. Hmm. It's to do with facial recognition cameras that are on every street corner. That is to do with every audio signal that's ever picked up from you. Not just digital audio, but also just normal day-to-day -day audio, your voices, the way you speak in the shops. All of that is picked up, right? your movements, your location code, 
um, the dresses that you wear, where you go, your visiting habits, all of that information is being combined in that region at the moment. Yeah. And the people who are living there are living that dystopian future. I mean, I don't think there's any two ways about it. I don't think even the Western press or anybody else kind of contends that situation that is happening at the moment. Yeah. It's, it's to the extent that when we talk about, in digital terms, tracking eyeballs, mm. um, what we normally mean is, you know, where are you looking on the screen, right? But in, in places like that, the, the technology has been developed to literally track your eyeballs. So when you're walking down the street, they can figure out where your eyes are moving towards and where your eyes are not moving towards. Right. Whether you're looking suspicious in that manner, what your facial features are saying about you. Mm -hmm. So the empathy, the actual uh, disturbances that you have, the anxiety that you have on your faces mm -hmm. can all be measured very realistically and very practically even now. And this is a kind of a uh, predictive police state that we have. So right. from the film uh, Minority Report, if you've ever seen it, right? So, mm. so where you've got this instance of predictive policing, mm. that is actually not a dystopian future for the people of, uh, of Xinjiang. So this is actually a reality. So the computer says, this person, we've tracked this person's mm. behavior for the last six months or three months, and we think they should go to the concentration camp for re-education. Exactly. So that, that comes from the computer itself. Exactly. And it's before the crime is committed or the right. so-called crime is committed. Right. So that's what predictive policing is about. So they take a bunch of features. They take a bunch of your anxiety in the street, the way you've been going, the way you're passing a mosque, for example, the yeah. way you're looking at your family or the way you're looking at the policeman. Yeah. They combine those features together and then they build this picture about okay, Jalal is now ripe for re-education. Mm. And that is not something that is way in the future. That is actually happening now. So there is this intense competition between China and the mm. United States mm. over the, the future of technology and AI, of yeah. course, is, is factors in all of this. And, and of course, the, the Americans have recently uh, uh, forbade companies within the United States from mm -hmm. selling these high-end semiconductor chips mm -hmm. to China and also is pressurizing its allies uh, to prevent those chips to, to enter Chinese territory. Um, so is this all about AI? Are the Americans trying to potentially stop the Chinese from achieving those breakthroughs in AI so that the Americans can catch up and, and potentially win this technological conflict? So I think... AI does certainly have a very major role to play in this, mm. in the geopolitical nature of the rivalry between uh, the US and China. Yeah. But it's not just AI. Okay. I think there's an economical aspect to this as well, in right. terms of with the way the world economy works, who sets the rules for the world economy, sure. uh, I, I think is a major aspect. Mm. But certainly in terms of semiconductor chips, it's a very interesting area yeah. because um, although China has its proliferation of these devices and these data points, especially in a, what they call a troublesome region like Xinjiang, um, but also throughout the rest of China, I think the nature of chips is such that there is still a major advantage for the West. Mm. So the, I think China released its new chip in the Huawei chip, which is about seven nanometers at the moment. Uh, yeah, yeah. Whereas the West at the moment are on chips, which are about three to four nanometers, which is a lot smaller. And the reason for this is because the infrastructure behind semiconductors is very interesting. Um, most of the semiconductor factories are in actually Taiwan. Yeah. So China doesn't have direct access to those. It can only copy what it sees in, in many ways. And the main uh, limiting factor for the Chinese is the fact that the company that makes these high-end chips is in, is in Holland. There's only one company that does this throughout the world, which is called ASML. Mm. And ASML have these machines which are composed of 2 million plus parts, which reach temperatures three times the temperature of the sun in the middle, which have purities of their mirrors to some sort of nth degree of, of magnitude. So those kind of things are not easy to reproduce. And there is a limiting factor to what the Chinese can do. They're always playing catch up at the moment and still it's a game of catch up. So I think the United States wants to keep it that way moving forward. Okay. Now, Riaz, I mean, I, I've had this ache in my arm for the last three months. When I stretch my arm, 
uh, I get this pain. It's a dull pain. So I went to the doctors and doctors said, take some paracetamol and, you know, uh, it should, it should, it should get better soon. Can there be a point in the future where I can just, I don't know, get a computer to scan my arm and it automatically gives me a, a diagnosis for my arm ache rather than just giving right. me paracetamol, which every doctor does to yeah. just fob you off. Yeah. And, I'm and, surprised you haven't done that already. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, uh, I think your point is correct, right? Yeah. So I, AI doctors? AI doctors, right. So I remember doing, when I was a student many, many years ago, I actually did a thesis on replacing general practitioners. Now, it's not to be disparaging towards general practitioners yeah. in some ways, but... You wrote your dissertation on, on that. this. Yeah. When, when was this? this? Was... I don't want to show your age, but when was... <laughs> Let's say sometime in the 90s, right? Yes. Okay. Um, but, the, but the theory behind that, and as I said before, the issue of neural networks and how decisions are made and how prognosis are made yeah. is still the same. It's just that, that at that time, the actual computational power wasn't present to engage in this, ah, right? right? So the actual basis of making decisions and taking the human element out of it or taking subjectivity out of it as much as possible yeah. was still the same basis as we're working to today. Right. So when we look at, when we go to our GPs and the GP types something in Google and mm. it just comes up with an answer and mm. Google is powered by AI to a certain extent as well. So we can't just say Google is just a search engine anymore. Oh, oh. It is powered by some elements of AI. So we can see all of that kind of um, happening before our eyes. Mm. So we can see this proliferation of scanning things, taking photos of issues, uh, putting it into chat GPT, saying, what's this image, you know, this art, this pain in Jalal's arm, what is it likely to be? Yeah. And things like chat GPT probably can give you, if not now, in the very near future, mm -hmm. a reasonably 95% accuracy about ah. what that condition can be. Right. Right. So... In essence, it's the medical profession is just one of the professions it's going to impact in that manner. And there's, you know, we can talk about the issue of work and there's many other things that it can impact in a similar manner. Well, actually, uh, so which professions are going to be redundant, do you feel, as a mm. result of AI technology? So I think that's an interesting question. If you'd asked me, let's say, 10 to 5 years ago mm. about which professions it would kind of replace and which ones it wouldn't. Yeah. I would have said to you, professions which involve manual dexterity, for example, dentists, yeah. surgeons, yeah. Um, cooks, maybe, right? Chefs. I would have said to you, those professions are very difficult to replace. Can AI because, make a better biryani than my well, mom's? Well, maybe it can, really? right? So. I was. I would have said to you ten years ago that those those kind of professions are very difficult. Are to difficult. Okay. Difficult to replace. Right. right. But I think I've changed my view on that. Really. Yeah. I saw a machine. I think it was Uniqlo that folded a T-shirt, and for, on seeing something like that, you think that the minute aspects of manual dexterity that's needed that we take for granted in order in order to do a task like that mm. is suddenly achievable. Really. So, those kind of professions I don't think are no longer safe either, mm. right? So it depends to what degree robotics and to what degree our capabilities evolve. But mm. I think certainly most of the professions in the world are prone to this. Because if you think about how professions work, manual labor, the things that we used to take for granted as manual labor, putting bricks up, um, you know, working on an assembly line, um, things of that nature are generally now extinct, right. right? So we don't work with 15 people on an assembly line putting caps on a on a toothpaste bottle anymore, yeah. right? So some of most of those things have been automated, but it, they have been seamlessly automated. So we don't recognize that they have actually gone. Mm -hmm. Those jobs have gone. Mm -hmm. What it means for employment is a different question now, yeah. right? So I think it was Keynes in the 1930s, John Maynard Keynes, who said that there will be a time of technological unemployment, which is a quite a prescient view that he had at the time. Yeah. And he suggested that the main challenge for mankind would be what to do with the leisure that science has bought for it, right. right? So that's our main conundrum at the moment, if you like, is what to do with so many people who will naturally, their jobs will become obfuscated in many ways. Yeah. And how do we then occupy our time? How do we earn a living? What are the main issues that are now involved in this aspect? 
right? But wouldn't that exacerbate inequalities? I mean, if capitalism <clears throat> is serves a society which is unequal, a technologically driven capitalism, those who own the AI certainly are going to be the, 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 the elites, whereas those who are now out of work What's going to happen to them? Well, certainly. So it depends on how we organize our economy, right? Right, and how we organize our lives, because yeah. the economic paradigm has changed now. Mm. So the economic paradigm has changed from something being uh, just a a rat race between capitalists and socialists to mm. being a different way of looking at things. So some of the old economic models are no longer true, right? So we have um, something called productivity, right? So Generally, what happens is when productivity increases, your wages go up and then you can produce twice as more, you can earn twice as more, and mm. then therefore your standard of living goes up. Right. But that's no longer true because the productivity is happening not because of you, it's happening because of a machine. Right. right? So therefore, you are not going to see those level of wage increases that used to happen. So we need a different way of organizing labor. We need a different paradigm in which to understand these things. Mm. I think it's also more acute for the developing world in many sense, because in the developing world, the, the, the route to development has always been the provision of cheap labor. I mean, that's how China developed. That's how many countries in the Far East have developed. But now suddenly, if people can use advanced robotics instead of cheap labor in the Far East or in the Southeast or in Africa or wherever, mm. what is the route to development of those countries? Yeah. That, that's a very perplexing question, it's something that Jeffrey Sachs uh, aired a while ago, and it's something that we need to understand and work out. Um, so it's a manner of, of organizing the economy and how it works. Mm. I think also some of the assumptions that we made about different economic systems come into question again. Yeah. So for example, um, one of the assumptions or one of the, um, uh, uh, one of the drawbacks of a planned economy as such before was the fact that it isn't humanly possible to plan everything. So that's what people used to argue against the old Soviet Union, that a planned economy simply doesn't work because it's humanly impossible to plan what your demand is going to be, what the supply of a particular good is going to be, and how that will kind of distribute itself and work out. Mm. But now that assumption in many ways doesn't hold true because we have systems that can plan to an acute level. I mean, just look inside an Amazon warehouse and the, the amount of automated planning that's done there in terms of your deliveries, your minute deliveries that come out to you on a, on a very regular basis. Yeah. So a planned economy is not beyond the realms of a future AI. So some of those presumptions that we made suddenly come back into question. Really? So, yeah. okay, I understand that. So socialism argues that the government essentially mm. should plan decisions about supply, about production and, and, and distribution. Your point is, uh, and, and the capitalist argument against that has always been that that's completely unproductive mm -hmm. and human beings just can't make those sorts of finer decisions exactly. and it leads to mass famine and starvation. Mm -hmm. Your point is that uh, potentially technology can actually realize that type of centralized planning much better than human beings? Exactly, that's right. right. Yeah. And it doesn't even have to be centralized, it can be distributed, Really. right? So the technology can be distributed yeah. and it can work in that manner. So I think what I'm trying to highlight is that different economic paradigms are necessary now to move forward with. Yeah. It's not so much what we assume to be the economic justice before and yeah. how it happens. I think the main questions around economics are going to be distributive justice. Yeah. And how do we ensure that the populations of the world with the values that people hold are going to be living a contented and a, a life with a good standard of living? I mean, I haven't invited you in to talk about Islamic economics, but then it, I know that you, mm. uh, you think a lot about Islamic economics. I mean, uh, for example, UBI, universal basic income, uh, if you have a, a type of economic society where machines do the bulk of the work and you no longer need diagnostic nurses and doctors possibly even and, and your local GP is replaced by an AI bot, uh, then surely there is a need for the state to then distribute some of that those funds in welfare payments mm -hmm. to those people out, out of work. Um, my understanding of Islamic economics is it's based on work. It's based on humans 
actually putting in the effort themselves rather than handouts from the central government. So how would we as Muslims navigate that type of economic life? Well, I think this goes to the heart of the question where we're at the nexus really of technology, uh, economics, uh, political philosophy, if you like, yeah. um, and creed, mm -hmm. right? So this is where all of those factors come into being. What, what is work? Mm. Well, what is striving for work? Yeah. We can, we can argue the fact that for 10,000 years, we have actually been behaving as automated robots. We've been on the assembly lines, post-industrial revolution, we've been doing menial jobs that, to be quite frank, most of us are not interested in. Right? Grudgingly, we do those jobs to pay our bills, to pay yeah. our rent. Yeah. Um, That's since... what I said to my boss when I resigned. <laughs> <laughs> yes. right. yeah. But I don't know how a teacher would feel about that, but yeah. anyway. Um, but also since the advent of uh, technology, people yeah. have been pushing numbers into a spreadsheet, mm. right? Let's say, right, as a general office work. Mm. Why is that so fulfilling? Why is that so uh, meaningful, if you like? You know, surely if we can get a better way of doing that, surely that frees people up to do a lot more. Mm. Now, this goes back again, there's a parable about um, something called the Mexican fisherman who was uh, lying on a beach and he just fished enough fish to keep him satisfied. Mm. And then a big businessman came over and said, why don't you expand your fishing fleet and do this? And he kept asking him why, why? He said, well, so you can get loads of fishing fleets. And then he said, what will I do then? He said, well, then you can sit on a beach and not do anything, which is, <laughs> which you know, doing, which is yeah. come back in the circle. So, yeah. so I think when we look at work, we, we look at work, we need to understand work again in a different way. Right. You know, what does work mean? What does striving mean for us, right? So striving. So in terms of Islam, in terms of our Muslim essence, really, what does striving mean? Does striving mean to work, right? Or does striving mean to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best way that we can? So for example, some elements of AI, you could argue Islamically that you know, when some people push against technology, that that is actually the wrong thing to do. So mm -hmm. you mentioned self-driving cars before. Yeah, it's it, by many reports, and I don't think this is a contentious issue anymore. By many reports, it's said that the advent of self-driving cars in our roads would cut the deaths on our roads by at least a half. Mm -hmm. So, as a Muslim community, why wouldn't we appreciate that? Why wouldn't we, you know, run to that kind of solution, right? Um, so it's, it's understanding what we mean and the issue of work, we don't, we don't, it's not an end in itself, right? It's to understand what we need to do in life, right? So if worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes easier with more free time, for example, um, how we recognize our spirituality becomes more easier, then why should we not, uh, you know, absorb that? Why what does that do to things like, I don't know, manhood, for example, mm -hmm. you know, if they, if a suitor came to my house to marry my daughter and said, and I asked them, what do you do for work? And said, I'm on universal basic income because the machines <laughs> have taken my, doesn't that impact some very basic, the very basic dynamics of a family and a home in Islam? Well, it depends how the world evolves till that state comes, I right. think. Uh, by the way, I'm not in favor of a universal basic income. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm more in favor of something called the government acting um, as an employer of last resort, uh -huh. more, more pertinent, which is almost like a job guarantee scheme for people really? who are out of work. Right. Uh, in terms of doing social work and you know other aspects of things. Yeah. But it depends how things evolve because we've gone from a situation in post-industrial uh, Victorian Britain, let's say, where people were working seven days a week, six days a week, down the mines, yeah. 12, 14 hours a day, to a situation now where it's the common law to work five days a week. Mm. And there are some, and since COVID, that work has turned into flexible work. Right. It's turned into, you know, Fridays, the Fridays, a new Saturday almost mm. kind of thing, right? Mm. So the four day week has been experimented with, with a number of uh, companies and councils, and they have found that to be very productive and they don't lose productivity because of things like that. Right. So that's the general trajectory of where we're going with work. So, Going back to your example, if someone came up and said, well, I only work four days a week, mm -hmm. but I do this and this, and then with the rest of my time, I do this and this, you'll have a different criteria by which to appreciate the person, Yeah, I would guess. You paint a really idealistic world. I would love to be someone who's sitting on the beach and you know get an AI 
machine to do my podcast interviews <laughs> and to do my my work for me. But uh, isn't there a, a a back to the original theme? Isn't there a mm. dystopian side to this? I mean, I I read that 350 scientists and computer experts wrote a one line letter saying that <clears throat> AI has the potential to be disastrous for the world and we need to take action now yeah. on the level of, say, terrorism or climate change. Mm -hmm. So these are people who are integral to the development of AI, but they're voicing their concerns about AI. I mean, how, you know, is what's the bleak side to this? I, th I think there's many bleak sides to this. So yeah. um, the people who signed that letter, Jeffrey Hinton, I think, was one of them, mm -hmm. Mustafa Suleiman, amongst others, and and a number of people signed that letter. Mm. I, I think they're raising a very genuine concern. Yeah. The genuine concern is about artificial general purpose intelligence. Mm. It's not the kind of intelligence that we have now per se, that's on your Google search engines or anything right. else. Right. The narrow AI that we were talking about, which just finds correlations between data sets. Yeah. It's about when there's recursive self-improvement to AI systems right. and once we've wound up the machine and we've let it go that we have no control over it that yeah. we lose our autonomy from those machines when we lose our autonomy what happens is those machines have three primary directives that are almost inbuilt into those machines mm -hmm. things like self-preservation so you can't switch it off so we talk about some sort of a kill switch as a regulation that some human can operate mm -hmm. but sometimes a machine may overcome that you know there's I think there was a film way long ago called War Games where people weren't able to turn the machine off, where it was, um, uh, I think the scenario was yeah. thermonuclear war. Right? Yeah. So you, you have the self-preservation aspect. The second aspect that you have on this is the ability to, for this machine to go out and secure resources to achieve its objective. Mm. So you give it an objective, let's say, I don't know, you give an objective to, to turn out, you know, 10,000 toothpaste tubes uh, uh, an hour or something. Yeah. It finds it's run out of toothpaste. It goes off to somewhere else to procure that toothpaste. And then it doesn't worry about the consequences or the externalities that that will have. Mm. And it just tries to fulfill its objective. So it kills human beings. It kills toothpaste. horses to make toothpaste or right. whatever, whatever, you know, yeah. you know, any number of scenarios can yeah. happen. Yeah. And then there's the issue about self-learning. So these three aspects are almost inbuilt into general purpose AI, mm. right? However, coupled with that is what we call a wrong objective function in machines, which means that we need to worry about what kind of objectives we're setting these machines. Right. Because if objectives can be set, but we may not understand the unintended consequences behind these objectives, mm. right? So let me give you an example. This is an example that Stuart Russell uses, which is quite apt. Mm. You have a family uh, and you have a robot uh, babysitting that family. The parents have gone out. They've asked a the robot to take care of the kids mm. and feed the kids and, and what have you. Mm. Um, during the evening, the kids get hungry. The robot goes, looks in the fridge and finds there's no food there. So its objective is to feed the kids. The next thing it does, it sees the family cat. So no way this is going. Yes. Yeah. So the rest is history or yeah. could be history. Right. right. So we can see where those kind of objective, that's pretty much an extreme example, but you mm. can see where these kind of suboptimal objectives can lead to. Mm. The way to guard against those objectives is not foolproof. And that's what people have worries about because we can set a machine on day one to have an objective. Yeah. We can figure out all the consequences that we think are humanly possible yeah. for that machine not to misbehave, but we have the potential to miss lots of things. Yeah. So a way around this, which is the theory that I think works perhaps the best at the moment is again by uh, Stuart Russell, which is about making the machine defer to human beings in its decisions. Right? So not to carry out the killing of the cat, yeah. but to defer to human beings before it carries out that action or makes that decision moving forward. But, but you know, that would depend on responsible actors mm -hmm. who define the limits of this AI technology. And of course, you have got rogue states like mm -hmm. China, like Russia, and dare I say, even America mm -hmm. uh, that uh, can use, can... Uh, cannot set these guardrails for their own particular objectives. I mean, you know, 
what you're calling for is is almost like an international constitution, which I think in today's very heavily contested world, that's probably quite difficult to achieve, right? Yeah, and it is difficult to achieve, and you're right. And I think you know you've got your political uh, world economy, world politics hat on there to appreciate mm. that, and people kind of. Uh, minimize that aspect of things. I know there are some people within the tech world who have said, well, we do similar things for, for example, airplanes, right? We have a black box. Everyone yeah. agrees to that aspect. We have right. air routes uh, over the world. Right. So there's uh, a all, regulatory there's system. A, there's a regulatory yeah. system. Everybody yeah. agrees to that. We all yeah. abide by that. We yeah. are, all have the same charges yeah. uh, on our phones or whatever. I think the EU is putting out a new one. Yeah. So, you know, we do have that in many respects. But I think AI is different because of the advantages it offers, because of the benefits it can offer a rogue nation, for example. So therefore, there's every incentive for a North Korea or for somebody else to go out and do things which are not within the international realm. Yeah. And once you let the genie out of the bottle, it's very hard to put back again. Right. So therefore, you have these things about objectives which are so key to how this will function moving into the future. Yeah. Um, and it's some it's it's a it's an unknown world that we're mm. going into. Nobody has direct answers for this at the moment. Even more scarier, I suppose, is AI injected into warfare, modern warfare. Mm. Um, how much has AI integrated into into conflict, and how what's the potential of AI? I mean, could we have AI armies in the future, robotic armies? Well, we're already having AI armies now so i don't think yeah. that's a question for the future really um if you look at the ukraine conflict for example mm. some people and maybe this is a bit of conspiratorial thing but people say the ukraine conflict has been elongated to be a laboratory or a test bed mm. for ai weaponry of the future really? right so you have drones you have uh you know uh, boat drones you have air drones you have small minuscule drones that are, are operating on things you have automated warfare. Uh, you have assassinations being carried out by Israel using automated machine guns, mm -hmm. remote control machine guns. So the element of warfare and the element of robotics, if you like, robotics coupled with intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, with general purpose AI, is a very frightening scenario. Mm -hmm. It's something that is very, very hard to control. And it's something that in terms of the arms race, can go in any direction. Yeah. People argue, people say that the nuclear proliferation at the end of the Second World War was a similar aspect, yet right. we developed a mechanism to control that. Yeah. We developed the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. We developed a hotline between the Soviet Union and, and the States. But I think this has got, this is far more diffused than that. Mm. You needed some sort of infrastructure to build nuclear weapons. You needed some sort of understanding. You needed some sort of way to do that. The technology here, especially with the onset of open source code, which means that everybody can have access to AI technology in some way, shape or form, huh. can become very diffused and very, very quickly as well. Can I ask about, from a Muslim perspective, mm. the process of ishtihad? So we may come across a new problem, mm -hmm. you know, um, Bitcoin, you know, uh, or whatever it, whatever it may be. And uh, we go to a scholar and we seek... Uh, uh, a solution, a, a legislative answer from that scholar. Is it halal or is it haram? Mm. And uh, to simplify it, ishtihad is, is essentially two sides. You've got the understanding of the reality side and then you've got the appreciation of the text. And the deeper you understand the text and the Arabic language and, and, and how things are phrased and as well as the precedents that have been set through previous fatawa, the deeper your, your, out, your judgment is going to be. Can a machine replicate that process of ishtihad? Well, l let's take the second part of your um, analysis first, mm. which is the understanding of the Arabic language, the understanding of the corpus of text that we have throughout the 1500, 14, 1500 years of Islam. Um, there is nothing to suggest that that is in any way peculiar or in any way different to the way AI works on the English language. We can have the same level of understanding. We can have the same depth of 
syntax or semantic analysis that we have with the English language right. in that Arabic language. Right, right. So the same kind of processes that are involved in your chat GPT at the moment can be replicated almost in Arabic. And I think I passed on to you this, this site called Quran GPT at the moment, which is, I guess it's in its infancy at the moment, but there's nothing to suggest that something like that cannot develop. Mm. So that's concerning the text and how that's worked out. And so if you type in questions, for example, what does Islam say about Bitcoin? It can do the similar uh, processing that I described in terms of how ChatGPT or LLMs, large language models work in a similar fashion. It right. can go break up those little words into chunks, create association links, assign probabilities to them, manufacture the probabilities, understand which is the best probability of the answer, and then represent that back to you in that manner. Right. I don't think there's anything stopping that. Yeah. When it comes to ijtihad and when it comes to actual rulings of something new, that's where you have the added dimensions of the tahqiq al-manat, yeah, which is the understanding of the reality and the way the reality is then associated with the analogous text that mm. you have. Yeah. And that's where we've recently gone to mujtahids, or in the past we've gone to mujtahids to get that understanding. So they have an appreciation of what you've asked them and they've married it with qiyas and analogy of the text. And then they've come to a specific hukum, which can be right or wrong, as yeah. you well know. Yeah. So in that respect, the understanding of the reality is again, not a immovable barrier mm. for an AI system to do. Mm. If you were to ask ChatGPT about what Bitcoin is and you know what it entails and the, the different dimensions of cryptocurrency or whatever, it could give you a very prolonged and elongated answer to that, True. right? Yeah. And then all it has to do is marry that up with the, with the Arabic language to produce a virtual fatawa, if you like, that can be looked at. But again, this goes back to the issue of trust in those machines, right? So when we talked about trust before, we said, well, you know, do we want the machine to just present those things willy nilly, or do we want some sort of human oversight on those machines? Mm. And that's where I think the regulations and the framework needs to be there. So we need to carry out that oversight in terms of understanding what it is and what it can and can't do. Will AI solve the perennial moon sighting problem we face? <laughs> well, or will you get two AIs <laughs> arguing against one another the day before Eid, <laughs> saying that this is our Eid is tomorrow, and the other AI will say it's well, the day it, after? It depends if it's a Moroccan AI and a Saudi <laughs> AI, I guess, or a, or a Walthamstow AI, I guess. Yeah, I, I think there are some problems <laughs> that are impossible to resolve, and this is one of them. <laughs> Maybe that's the intractable problem. Yeah. That's right. Um, okay, um, let me ask you a question. Which I forgive me; it may sound philosophical, but. Can you imagine AGI, artificial general intelligence, acquiring a level of consciousness that human beings have? Yeah, so th this question, especially since the advent of ChatGPT, has been posed more and more. Mm. Um, the, the actual question isn't new. The question has existed since earlier times, since the 18th century and even before that, I guess since even the times of Aristotle or the times of, you know, Imam Ghazali yeah. and people like that. The recent is, recently has become, because of the advances in technology, has become more and more, has come more and more to the fore. Um, I think the issue about what they call a singularity, where a being or a virtual AI machine takes on consciousness or becoming sentient, if you like, where it takes on that, ability to think for itself um, is something that we need to understand a bit more pristinely within the Muslim world as such. Right. Anyway, within the Western context, I think, and within the champions of AI at the moment, they equate intelligence to sense, you sentient or to a singularity or to the word of consciousness. So when you think you are conscious. You, when you think you are conscious okay. is the old saying of Descartes, right? right. You, I think, therefore I am. Right. Um, but I think the, the, the essence is being missed there because no one has been able to define what consciousness is. No one in the history, post-AI, pre-AI, or even before that, has actually had a buttonhole definition of what consciousness is. Right. No one has been able to detect what consciousness is. 
But from our Islamic understanding, we have more of an idea about what consciousness is than anybody else. So for example, we don't equate consciousness just to intelligence. You know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us something called the secret of consciousness. He has made mankind the ashraf al which means the best of beings. You know, there's some debate whether it's angels or mankind in Islamic mm-hmm. scholarship, but mm-hmm. generally it's certainly above different beings like mm-hmm. you know, virtual beings or machines anyway, mm-hmm. right? And over animals. Mm-hmm. So it's not really our biological function that gives us consciousness. Yeah. It's not really even our intelligence that gives us consciousness. It's a secret that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we believe in, yeah? Our has, has soul, given, our, our soul, our ruh that right. gives us consciousness. Right. Right. And that's something to a non-Muslim mind is hard to appreciate and is hard to decipher in, in many ways from, yeah. from their understanding. Yeah. And that's why I think we're almost in a privileged position to understand and answer this question. Mm. And this is something that we should be almost proud of in terms of understanding that Islam does give a framework for us to understand what this is about. Mm. It is not just about intelligence. Because I feel what's happened is, is there's been an element of hubris within Silicon Valley and other places where people have made all these developments and suddenly they've kind of almost implicitly allocated intelligence to being conscious in some way or shape right. or form. Right. And that's what's caused these kind of questions to crop up from time to time. But again, going back to ChatGPT and the large language models, when I express this issue about the fact that it can't understand language, but it gives a semblance or the perception of understanding language mm. because it's actually converting those words into statistical frameworks or chunks or tokens, mm. and then it's rearranging them and then pushing you an answer. Yeah. The semblance of an understanding doesn't mean that it's understanding. In the same way, the semblance of intelligence doesn't mean that it's intelligent. And that's something for us that's very vital to understand because we can be duped into thinking, well, this is so pervasive now. This is almost doing everything that I used to do. This is in our homes. This is in our minds. We've got personal assistance. Yeah. The robot has empathy. It has almost a semblance of creativity. There was a, uh, a big sculpture, I think, in the, in the uh, New York Museum of Modern Art, which kind of flips over so many times and creates new works of art every few seconds. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that there's creativity behind that sphere. It means that there's a series of calculations that's happening in the background. Right. The human brush stroke or the human composition or the human prose, although AI can mimic that to some extent, it's giving you the semblance of creating that stuff, but it's not actually creating that thing. Right. The point you make, Ben, about the soul, the ruh, is interesting. So we as Muslims believe it's impossible, even if AI does get to the stage where its intelligence is greater than human intelligence, uh, it would never be conscious because it would never have what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to human beings and that is the soul. Yes, exactly. Which is the secret of consciousness, which as Muslims, we have to believe in, right? Because we believe in the creator, we believe in the creator above all else. Yes. Above all AI, all AI beings, you know? Where then does it leave trust? Until now, I mean, the Enlightenment has given us a unbridled trust in human beings and their mm. ability to reason. Um, and European society was built on this, uh, on this absolute belief in, in the human being and, and, as I said, their ability to think. But of course... Uh, we're now coming to a stage where we realize that these machines can probably think better than us or at Mm. least come to better conclusions. Um, Is the era of the humans over and now we're going to look at machines as somehow godly or above our our human frailties? Well, firstly, I think it lays bare the the claims of the Enlightenment, really, that human reason is is above all else. Mm -hmm. Human reason is the yardstick by which everything has to be measured. Sure. So we have just shown that humans have created or are about to create or may create these beings which are more superior than us in terms Mm -hmm. of intelligence, in terms of rationality, Mm -hmm. or the way the rationality was perceived during the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So that's one factor. I think in terms of trust, what do we do with these machines, right? So from an Islamic point of view, I don't think, and issue of trust does come in because we don't we don't claim to put 
caps on toothpaste bottles quicker than machines, right? right. So we know we can't do that. Yeah. We don't claim to say that we can work out a, a 60 column spreadsheet with the same level of speed and the same level of accuracy that an Excel program can, yeah. right? We don't claim to do those things. So for us, it's not a race. It's not a, it's not a measure of saying we are better than the machine or we are mm. not better than the machine. Right. We need to understand how to use the machine to augment our lives mm. in, in a proper manner that doesn't uh, dilute our faith that doesn't dilute our reason for existence and that doesn't dilute the way or the commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down for us. Mm. So in many ways, I think it's a problem for liberalism and it's a problem for the enlightenment and it's a problem for rationality in human beings, uh, the way the, the Western world has developed over the last 200 years. But I don't think it's such a problem for Muslims in that manner because we never view rationality as human rationality above all else. We have always succumbed to and we have always deferred to the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all things, in intelligence, in emotions, in the way that we live our lives and everything else. Sometimes uh, Muslims uh, come to conclusions that are opposed to Islam, especially educated Muslims. Mm. Could you imagine one day, instead of an educated Muslim who studies philosophy, he comes out and says human reason is greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they will come out of university saying that the supercomputer is greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, <laughs> I, 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 I don't dispute that that could happen. Yeah. Um, but again, it, it's, it's the guardrails that we have to put in a place for right. us. And it's our understanding of our Aqeedah that's fundamental here, mm. right? So our understanding of the Aqeedah and the conversation that we've just had about consciousness and about the Ruh and about the existence and about what it means to be a human being. What, is, what does humanity mean for us? Mm. Those are key questions that we have to instill within ourselves, within our community, to understand how to tackle these challenges that are on the horizon, to be perfectly honest, they are not far away. You right. know, the, these challenges with our youth and stuff, we will have questions like that. We will have questions about sentiency. We will have questions about the singularity and about the robot who can do everything. And we need to answer them and we need to frame them in that manner to understand how to tackle them. Yeah. Lastly, um, Riaz, can a supercomputer become a Khalifa? <laughs> um, it depends, right? So I it know, it, I know it's, <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a contentious answer, but it yeah. depends to what degree, right? Yeah. Um, if you're asking about decision-making in the political realm, for example, or in the economic realm or in the social realm, mm. then certainly we can take help from uh, things that AI will generate for us in terms of making these decisions. In fact, some exercises were done with that previously. So Dominic Cummins was using something called super, super forecasting, right? Dominic Cummins was the senior advisor to, to Boris, Boris Johnson. Johnson. Exactly. Yeah. So he was using a theory laid out by a guy called Philip Tetlock, mm. uh, who wrote a book about super forecasting, which is to amalgamate data, a data-driven exercise in mm. terms of understanding how policies should work and how policies would be perceived, right. and then to come out with that generation. So yes. that's not dissimilar to how AI would work, uh -huh. right? So now we've got archaic mechanisms of politics because politics yeah. was really fashioned after the industrial revolution mm. to deal with some of those aspects. And now you can see the archaic nature of political systems in the West, voting every four years for a particular issue, um, understanding that you can't have a say in different things all the time, which technology allows you to do, right? Uh, so those are things that are gonna come to the precipice at some point in time. But things to do with forecasting, things to do with uh, measuring the difference in policy uh, um, parameters or understanding policy interventions or the impact of different policy interventions on other policy interventions, that's something that can be data-driven to an extent. But I think what we have to be careful of is, again, having these human guardrails around the thing, to, around to have the machine, if you are to have a machine in wherever you're going to have it in Baghdad or whatever, you need to have it defer to human beings when the ultimate decisions come. And politics is an art of associating people with other people. So we need to understand how that framework would work. Brother Riyaz Hassan, it's truly been a fascinating discussion. Jazakallah khair very much for your time today. Jazakallah khair for having Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels.
and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.